Previously, I shared a bunch of the details of designing and building this high tunnel, but now it's time to look at some of the results. This is a quick review. The frame was designed to fully expose the blocks to direct sunlight for the three months around the winter solstice, fully shade them the three months around the summer solstice, and throughout all seasons ensure that the growing area receives full direct sunlight. The southern portions of the system are covered by a double-layered inflated polyethylene film, and the northern portions have an insulated covering. The heat storage system consists of two-foot-thick portable concrete blocks that are readily available throughout the United States. On the left side of this illustration, we have the inside of the tunnel, and on the right side we have the exterior. When the sun comes up, it shines on the blocks, gradually warming them up. By the time the sun sets, they've absorbed a fair amount of the heat, helping to keep the high tunnel cooler during the day, and then giving that heat back up to the inside air at night to help dampen the daily fluctuation of temperatures in the structure. I grabbed this quick photo of the wall with my thermal camera when we were building it one evening. Even before we had the film on, working beside these blocks in the evening felt noticeably warmer due to the radiant heat given off by the blocks. As a part of this study, I wanted to compare the effect of staining the blocks black versus leaving them natural. Staining the blocks adds a little bit of cost and labor, which I wanted to avoid if possible. Temperature sensors were added between the two blocks, one black and one white, at multiple depths, one inch and eight inches. I originally wanted to get a sensor to the depth of 12 inches to the center of the blocks, but drilling small holes to the depth in these blocks uh, with the quartzite aggregate just wasn't feasible. Now for some of the data. Here is a six-day view of the block temperatures from January 27th to February 2nd. The black and the white lines are the black and the white blocks. The dotted lines are the temperatures at one inch depth, while the solid lines are at eight inch depth. As expected, the outer surface heats much faster and conducts heat gradually inwards. The black block absorbs and emits more heat than the white blocks. We can see this in the greater upward slope when it's absorbing heat and in the faster downward slope when emitting heat. It may also be worth noting that the general upward trend of the block temperatures is partially due to the increasing day length as well as an average outdoor temperature that is trending upwards during this time period. I thought this was a neat uh, thermal camera image showing the black block temperature being substantially warmer than the surrounding white blocks. Another nice way to look at the temperature difference between the black and the white blocks is to graph it. Uh, this is a graph of the temperature difference, uh, so black block temperature minus white block temperature throughout the whole study period here, January and February. And you can see uh, it, anytime the temperatures are above zero, that means that the black blocks are warmer than the white blocks. And really, on quite a few of the days, we're getting temperatures that are, you know, five to eight degrees warmer uh, than the uh, natural colored block. And so we're really seeing a significant difference in the temperatures throughout the, the testing period here. With that information, I decided to dye all of the blocks black on February 18th. I was a little bit concerned that this would be a substantial effort since it's a 60 foot long wall. After researching a little more, I found that it was pretty easy to quickly spray on the stain with a cheap one gallon hand sprayer. Make sure that you use a dye meant for concrete, and once you fill the sprayer, complete the job quickly before it dries in the sprayer. Expect to throw away the sprayer when you're done. And it's also neat to see, I've seen the temperatures out here being pretty warm, so I moved my fig plants out here uh, so they could adjust to the weather and it was plenty safe for them. You can see some green weeds, dandelion stuff uh, growing even in late February. Next I'm going to take you through how all of these modifications to the high tunnel design affected the resulting air temperatures and the length of the growing season. Let's step back and have a little bit of a refresher on what our outdoor weather temperature was uh, during the study period. Uh, this is our weather temperature here through the winter of 2023 and 2024, November uh, through the end of October. We had our last frost date outside on April 24th, 
in our first frost date on October 3rd, which is actually fairly late for us. A lot of times I see it more on September 20th. So this gives us a total growing period uh, between frost seasons of 162 days. Actually a, a pretty good year for us. Now I had used a traditional high tunnel here as a benchmark to compare what this uh, modified design that I've been working on would do. Uh, so this here's our outdoor weather temperatures overlaid with uh, the red line and the black line here showing the daily highs and lows for this traditional high tunnel. I published a video uh, a few weeks back uh, summarizing the, the details of the study and uh, the high tunnel design and, and how the heating and cooling system of that worked. Uh, but just as a quick refresher here, uh, we had in this high tunnel, April 24th was the last frost date and October 31st was the first fall frost date. Uh, so that gave us 191 growing days, which is 29 additional days longer than growing outside, which is right in line with uh, NRCS's recommendations and what we should expect for a high tunnel. And here we have the data for the maximum season high tunnel prototype that we've been working on. We have the outside air temperatures in the background with the black line and the red line being our daily high and low temperatures measured four feet above the ground. So our last frost date here was February 28th. And our growing season continued up until December 5th, which didn't even fit on my graph here, where I was comparing to our outdoor air temperatures and our other high tunnel. Uh, but that's pretty exciting. It gives us 280 growing days or an additional 118 days versus growing outside. And here we have an overlay of the daily high and low temperatures for the two systems that I was comparing, the traditional high tunnel and this new maximum season design. It's a little bit hard to simplify and summarize everything that's happening in the data, but some of the key differences. We see a really nice increase or damping of the winter temperature swings, the low temperatures are substantially higher than in the traditional high tunnel, which is really one of our biggest challenges in South Dakota because we have some very severe temperature swings that make overwintering a lot of plants and crops very difficult. I think it's also interesting to see how big of a drop in the daily high temperatures can be achieved in the summer and fall because we're storing some of that heat into the blocks and really stabilizing our temperatures overall. So as an overview here, in our outdoor growing system, we have 162 frost-free growing days in 2024. In the traditional high tunnel, we had 190 days without any additional heat. And in the maximum season high tunnel, without any additional heat, we had 276 growing days. This is a really big increase. And I think it's really exciting to think about what we could use this for, for growing all kinds of crops that were maybe used to growing outdoors much longer and much better, as well as enabling a lot of crops that we really previously had no hope of growing in our climate. So we talked about a lot of numbers and data, and that's all fun, but it's more fun to talk about plants. So I thought I'd share some snapshots of the growing season here from 2024. I had chose to grow uh, super hot peppers in the high tone during this season because they're pretty low risk. If they die, I kill them off due to some failure or something with the system. While well, I'm testing stuff, it's not really a huge deal. Uh, so here we are on April 21st. Uh, capsicum chinense peppers or super hot peppers uh, really need a long growing season. So they're kind of neat to showcase uh, how uh, the system will work. I didn't really have my plants ready to go early enough because I wasn't expecting to be frost free at the end of February, but I got them in the ground here uh, by April 21st. And we got some nice growth going on here. June 2nd, they're really starting to take off. Uh, by June 24th, they're looking pretty peppery, pretty used to what uh, we'd be seeing around here. By July 20th, it's uh, maybe even starting to get a little bit overwhelming there. There's, uh, there's my wife, and they're getting close to being taller than her already. By August 17th, the peppers were getting pretty tall. Uh, they're actually getting taller here than Chris, one of the guys that helped me do a lot of the design work on this structure and building it. 
by September 3rd, 23rd, things were really getting out of hand and uh, we're picking quite a lot of produce and I really wasn't prepared uh, with a tall enough trellising system uh, for the pepper plants here in September. Um, and here we have a photo at the beginning of December here. This was actually the first date that I had a little bit of frost damage. So that's where I called this uh, the first frost date. But uh, actually you can see uh, just the tops of the plants are damaged and we still had a fair number of days or maybe a week or two uh, past December 5th before the plants were fully killed off. And this is pretty much me on December 6th. Uh, it was pretty wild. I wasn't prepared for this uh, level of growth and production. Uh, so it was pretty exciting. And here we got a quick picture of uh, some of the Carolina Reaper peppers uh, spread uh, pretty much all over this plant. If you're interested in a tour and you're in the area in eastern South Dakota sometime, uh, send me an email so we can coordinate and you can see what's growing at that time. And thanks for checking this out. This video was funded in part by USDA's South Dakota Specialty Crop Block Grant. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up and share it with your friends. I'd also love to know your thoughts. Comment down below and let's chat. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for more content like this.